This morning we're starting a new series, and this will be a little bit different than most series you might hear in a church, because we're going to talk a lot about technology, we're going to talk a lot about uh, space and biology and all kinds of other things in the uh, messages to come in this visit. And we're going to talk about technology a little bit today as well. We're actually going to try to look at, little by little, at the whole of human history from long in the past to far in the future. We're going to ask some ancient questions like, what does it all mean? Why are we here? Where did we come from? And we're going to ask some new questions as well. Things like, what is the technological singularity? That might be new to some of you. We're going to talk about that. Not today, but in this series we will. And we're going to ask some really kind of maybe odd questions like, am I more likely to be killed by a mosquito or a terrorist? Think about that one. We won't talk about it today, but we'll get to that one. So we're going to do some, some odd and unusual things, but I think we're going to have some fun too. Now I should say that, of course, Everything I share, of course, is related to my own experiences, my own beliefs, the questions I ask, the answers I find are rooted in who I am, and that's unavoidable, really. But I'll try to make it friendly for all of you as well. So who am I? Well, I'm a farm boy from Missouri. I'm a retired U.S. Marine, and I'm a missionary in Japan. And in all of those things, I've had different experiences, everything from dirt between my toes in Missouri, you know, to doing the Marine Corps thing and the missionary life that we're still continuing, my wife and I today. So I have a variety of experiences. I studied electrical engineering, did a master's degree in that, did some satellite design work on an antenna, and I also have done some very down-to-earth things like plant tomato plants that didn't grow and they died because the soil was wrong. When you're from Missouri, you're spoiled. The soil is so good, you just throw seeds down and they grow, but not so in California. <laughs> it's different there. But let's get on with it. Today's message is called Fast World, Slow World. So we live in some ways in a very fast world, but in other ways it's a slow world. Some things are changing all the time and some things hardly change at all. So. I want you to bring your imagination, get that out, you know, and it's okay to laugh and have a little fun in this. So we're going to test your imagination right now. I want you to imagine that there's going to be a race, and it's going to be a race against a, a Nozomi 500 Super Express train right there. Beautiful train. We're going to have a race between this Nozomi 500 Super Express train and Sheldon the Tortoise. Okay, now I want you to think about that for a minute. Think about it carefully for a moment. Now, who thinks Sheldon the tortoise can win the race? Who thinks the Nozomi 500 Super Express will win the race? Ah, somebody's thinking back there, right? Okay, well, it matters a little bit, as somebody back there pointed out. I think most people were say the Nozomi 500, but some people say, well, it depends. And now I'll give you another piece of information. Here's the race course. The race is from the cactus to the top of the mountain. Now, who thinks Sheldon the tortoise will win the race? Yeah, the tortoise will definitely win the race because the train cannot go there. There are no tracks, there's no electricity. The mountain is too steep for a train to climb. So you see, who will win the race depends on the course. But as 21st century human beings, we love our technology. I'm going to go out on a limb a little bit, and I'm going to say that everyone who thought immediately the Nozomi 500 would win the race, you thought that because you have a little bit of modern love of technology. <laughs> and because we love technology, and many of us are familiar with trains, and we're familiar with fast vehicles, and we know their potential and how they work, and we don't really know tortoises. So we don't think about what are the advantages of the tortoise and what are the disadvantages of the train. In fact, many of you may have accidentally changed the question in your mind without noticing it. That's okay. We're human beings. We do this all the time. I asked which one will win the race, but a lot of people think which one is fastest. It's a different question. The train is many times faster than the tortoise. But when we ask which one will win the race, 
we're asking a different question, and it depends almost entirely on the race course. But I thought it wouldn't be fair to make that tortoise try to go down the train tracks. So I made the race fair for the tortoise across the Picket Post Mountain in Arizona. This is the ter tortoise's home territory. The tortoise is very good out here, and the train cannot handle this. Now, that's us, but if you went back a few hundred years and you found some people from the Kumeyaay Indian tribe living in California, this picture is a painting uh, 17th century scene of those Indians. If you went back a few hundred years and you asked these people, even if you explained all about the Nozomi 500, even if you could show them one, they would almost certainly bet on the tortoise from the beginning because they don't know technology. They don't love technology, but they know animals. They live in the desert. The desert is their home and they live with the tortoise. They're in the same environment and they would imagine the race occurring where they live. And they would immediately say the train doesn't stand a chance. I'm pretty sure. Because they would know the train can't move in this desert. The tortoise is perfectly adapted to this desert. They had a love for nature and for animals. So they have a different thought process. But most of us, we might go to a zoo and see animals and say, man, those are cute and great and we're glad to see them. But we don't really know animals, especially maybe not a tortoise. So we don't understand or think about them. So a lot of how we perceive things depends on where we're from and the environment that we're accustomed to. Recently, I saw this. This is a driverless bus that's already in use in Tallinn, Estonia. I want to ride it. That's cool, a driverless bus running on the streets of the city. How many people want to ride in a driverless bus or car? Do you like that? Some people, some people aren't so sure. Well, those of you who want to, you'll have your chance very, very soon because in Tokyo right now, they are testing this robo-taxi to be used for the 2020 Olympics. So you go to the Olympics, you'll probably be able to ride the robo-taxi with no driver at all to get back and forth, at least on some routes. I have a love for technology because I'm a modern 21st century person. Well, maybe, okay, I may be more of a 20th century person, but we're in the 21st century, so I'm trying to keep up. And I think driverless vehicles are cool. I'd like to have one of these. You know, you just sit in the back, you know, and pop open a can of soda and say, driver, take me to the beach. But there's no driver, it's just a computer. But you just tell it where you want to go and off you go. Now, sometimes I think about, I'd like to go out to an uninhabited island and pioneer out on the uninhabited island with my wife, not quite alone. I'm, I, I'd want to be a hermit with wife, not a single hermit. But, you know, if you go to an uninhabited island and live there, it's not uninhabited anymore, so you've kind of ruined it before you get there. And I think about that, but I would probably never actually do such a thing because I love my technology. <laughs> so instead, I asked my wife for a smart speaker for my birthday. So now I have Alexa, an Amazon Echo device with the Alexa artificial intelligence personality in it. And when I go to bed at night, I just say, Alexa, wake me up at 6 a.m. with amazing grace. And Alexa does exactly what I ask her. See, I'm already thinking of it as her instead of it. And this is driving into our brains with the technology. We begin to think of our technological devices as he or she instead of just it. Because Alexa has a, a pleasant young lady's voice and speaks like a young lady. But you could also maybe set it to speak like an old man. Then you might think of it as he after a while. It's hard to think of it as an it when it talks like a person. Now today that's still somewhat limited, but that's being developed very, very rapidly. And the time is coming very soon where you will not be able to tell an artificial intelligence speaking through a speaker compared to a person on a telephone. You won't be able to tell the difference very soon. We can see that coming, at least in most conversations, regular conversations. As modern people, 
we love our technology and we enjoy using all of these great toys, you know, and seeing the new possibilities and they're just coming at us so fast like a fire hose. Every day the next model is coming out, whether it's smartphones or driverless vehicles or artificially intelligent programs running in speakers. Saw one the other day, runs in your microwave oven. So you just tell your microwave oven what you're cooking and it knows how much to cook it. Hey microwave, three pounds of spare ribs, frozen. Okay, coming right up. Tells you how long it'll take. None to perfection. It's coming. But do we lose something in all of this? We look at the Icarus, Icarus virtual reality flight simulator and a lot of us think, wow, look at that. You lay down in this thing and you can start the virtual reality program and you can feel like you're piloting a spaceship or a high performance aircraft and you see with your virtual goggles everything just as if you were in that environment. Or how about Second Life? Has anybody ever been in the Second Life community online? It's an online virtual world and it has millions of online residents who explore their world, they meet other residents, they create groups and socialize, they do activities individually or as a group. They build homes and businesses in this online world and make online money. They create art, they shop. Some countries even have embassies in Second Life where you can go and get your embassy to a real country in a virtual, I'm sorry, get your visa to a real country in a virtual embassy. Pretty strange, the reality and virtual reality are blending together and you can go to church or visit a temple in this virtual world of Second Life. We're fascinated by this stuff and it's meant to be so submersive that we, we go in and we forget about the outside world. We almost forget that what we're looking at is not real. You see, we get divorced from reality in some of these environments. For a little bit of fun or play, that's fine, but as people get into this, and some of them, you can go in there and spend hours and hours and completely forget the real world. And in there, sometimes we begin to forget things like love of people, love of life. We begin to forget things that are really important and really matter. Sometimes we are so hypnotized by it all that we can't look away and think about things that are actually much more important. So maybe we should go and try the slow life for a little while. But that's hard to do because the society we live in doesn't really allow you to easily get away for very long. How many people would like to go try the slow life without the technology for a while? Yeah, but for how long? Everybody thinks that sounds good, but does it sound good for a day, a week, a year, 10 years? You know, very quickly a lot of people begin to say, maybe not that long, <laughs> depending on their personality. What have we lost in living the fast life though? Well, let's think about life long ago. How about these guys? These guys are living way back there in the past and life was pretty simple back then. Kill or be killed, wild animal. Pretty simple, but not easy. We won't talk about what happens if you fail, but if you succeed in killing the beast, so to speak, then you have an all-you-can-eat barbecue and you have wonderful food, all you want for several days. But two weeks later, might be different. You can make clothing or blankets out of the skins, the fur, but a year later, what if you lose the fight? They slept in caves or handmade shelters, they built fires to cook, they took the skins to keep warm in winter, but later they began to develop crops and things and they had domestic animals and life became a little bit safer, a little bit easier, a little bit more predictable. How about these guys? This is Tessel in Niger in Algeria, Africa. You can go to the country of Algeria and you can go out in the Sahara Desert and you can visit this place. And they tell us, 
people who studied this, that 10,000 years ago, this was a lush and green area. It used to have a lot of rainfall. It used to be very beautiful. And there were lots of people living here. But then the, the climate patterns changed, and it stopped raining here. And now it's all Sahara Desert, because the desert is still expanding today. But if you went there, you'd find a life, you know, centered around livestock and taking care of livestock and community life. And we actually know quite a bit how they lived, even though it's estimated to be 10,000 years ago. Why do we know? Because of their love for art. This is some paintings from that community. They have a cave complex that they paint all over the walls and you can, you can see the people and the animals and you can get a very good idea looking at these different paintings of what life was like. Herding cattle, growing crops, making art. Doesn't sound so bad. Notice the art. This is important because in those times way back, even before agriculture, or now they have agriculture and they have a set community in this cave system and that area, or today, people make art. We're always called, we're, we're, we're driven that, sure, we have to take care of our basic needs like food and water and shelter, but once we get that done, we start making new things. We make tools that we can use. We make new systems of housing to be more comfortable or heating or cooling. We make art. We make songs. I wish we had some recordings of the songs the people back then sang, but we don't have that because there was no way to preserve their music. Sometimes you see pictures of musical instruments in the paintings, though. They had music. You see, so much has changed so rapidly, but some things don't change. The basic nature of a human being has not changed in thousands of years. Maybe not at all. So now we're going to transition a little bit. And, you know, there was a time about, about 3,500 years ago when there was a man named Moses, and he, he led the people of Israel out of Egypt. You know, everybody's seen a movie or something. You kind of know the story. And then God gives him the Ten Commandments. So let's look at three of those commandments that God gave. We could look at all ten and the result would be the same, but for time's sake, let's look at three. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. Now, those were written 3,500 years ago, and I'm sure that 10,000 years ago those same issues were there in that cave community in the Sahara Desert. What's the desert now? But how about today? Oh, we've come so far, we've made so much progress. Surely there are no longer no murders, no adultery, and nobody stealing anything in our society today, right? Mm, if you've watched the news, if you've read a newspaper, if you've looked online, you know that our societies today are full of the very same problems that they had thousands of years ago. Maybe you personally have never murdered or committed adultery and are very careful not to steal anything. But even yourself, personally, if you think about it, I'm sure you can think of something you have done that you knew was wrong. That word you should not have said. That time when you should have helped but didn't. Or when maybe, even as a child, you took something that wasn't yours. We've all done things that are not right. And our societies are plagued by the same moral problems, the same sorts of issues as people have been for thousands of years, and there has not really been any definable moral progress in humanity. In the ethical and moral realm, we're the same as we've always been what the Bible calls sinners. We do wrong, and we can't seem to help ourselves. Now, the tricky part of the Ten Commandments and the law given back in the time of Moses is this. A lot of people read that stuff and they think, God gave these commands and he expected the people to keep them. Now, God is smarter than that. 
God knew the people would not keep the commands when he gave them to them. He knew they would fail. So why did he give them those commands? Because the people did not know that they would fail. They did not recognize their own problems with ethics and morality. God gave the law to the people so that the people would realize we cannot keep the law. Some of them probably thought they could. Some of them probably even thought they would keep that law, but they failed. And that's what we realize. We fail because the human heart has not progressed. It's the same as it always has been. Now take a look at this from the book of Psalms. In the beginning, the psalmist is he's speaking to God here, and he says, In the beginning, you, God, laid the foundations of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. They will all wear out like a garment. Like clothing, you will change them, and they will be discarded. But you remain the same, and your years will never end. See, the creator God that the Bible tells us made the heavens and the earth. The Creator God does not change, and our hearts do not change. So there's this gap between the holiness of God and the reality of the human heart. And we discover through law, through rules, and our failure to keep them, that we need help. We can't do it on our own. Now, there's a lot here that is very much like what science would say. Ask a scientist, they will tell you, the sun, the sun will burn out. The stars, the stars will go dark. It may take a long time, but this world is temporary. But the Bible has told us that since thousands of years ago. The earth, the things that we know will perish, but God remains. And the Bible says they'll wear out like a garment and they'll be discarded guarded, but replaced by something better. So what is the solution for this gap between God, the creator who made the heavens and the earth and who has this wisdom and knowledge always and eternally? We see thousands of years ago that science is just now catching up with in some areas. What's the gap between that and our hearts? And how do we bridge that gap? Well, the Bible gives us a very direct and simple answer. And the answer is Jesus. It tells us in this book here, Hebrews, it says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. He is the answer to our sorrows. He is the answer to our pain. He is the answer for us who are lonely. He is the answer to the problems of the human heart because he brings us forgiveness, renewal, cleansing when we turn to him. Now, today I'm just introducing this idea and as we go along in this study, we'll take a look at some more things and we'll learn a little bit about it, sort of building bit by bit until we can see the structure of what God has done. And the history of humankind, both the past history and maybe some of the future history we'll also look at and where we're at today on that map. But I wanna leave you with this for today. Whatever your problem, whatever your struggle, Jesus is the answer. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, help us to recognize you as creator, Help us to recognize our need and to cry out for help. Send your son Jesus as you have for thousands of years to be our savior. Help us to know you, open our eyes to see. Help us to look away from the dazzling distractions of technology and the busyness of modern life. To take even a little time to think slowly and carefully about our needs and about the answer you've given in Jesus Christ. In whose name we pray, amen.